How's it going, everybody? I'm Jordan Pacheco. And I'm Rudy Carlos. Man, I have not heard that voice on this channel <laughs> in a long time, you cheater. And it's so good to see you again on the Glad Chat Podcast, brother. How you doing? It's good. The prodigal son has returned. You know, I've been uh, off doing a bunch of other things and uh, raising two little tiny girls. So uh, it's been a, it's been tough. But I think we're finally kind of getting getting to the point where I can uh, scoot off and, and do some things for myself. But uh, it's good to be back here with you, brother. That's absolutely right, my friend. And also, here's something nice. People don't have to speculate that we had a TNT fallout. You remember when that happened over <laughs> like the year after the summer of the same? So no, people, Rudy and I are good. We're always best friends forever. But uh, I'm really happy. This is going to be a great episode. We'll get right off into it. Nick Cavazos, the traditional Thomist, is back with us today. Nick, how you doing? You doing all right? I'm doing pretty good. Happy to be here. That's good, man. We got a lot to talk about, but of course, we'll hop right into it. This is huge news for us. I know a lot of us, we kind of all consume Daily Wire content. So it was kind of surprising to me this morning, right, boys, that I woke up, well, not terribly surprising, I suppose, but I woke up this morning and Candace Owens, the kind of firebrand black conservative chick over at Daily Wire, has been canned, sacked, or as Jeremy Bowen said in his tweet, they've parted ways. And so I wanted to get our reaction, but also I think what's funny is that there's no official reason why there could be a thousand reasons but because we don't care about a little bit of speculation i think it's because candace has been fighting with a lot of folks from the jewish community for the past few months and i'll kind of give a quick rundown uh after i get your all's thoughts but essentially she's been fighting with different rabbis she actually had uh ben shapiro gave her a pretty ad hominem attack a few mm -hmm. months ago talking about her ignorance apparently at least on this whole new uh conflict in palestine and israel but uh uh, Rudy, let's go ahead and start with you. Like, I know that you saw the news, man. What are you thinking? Well, I mean, it's such a PR thing to say, you know, oh, we parted ways, uh, you know, they try to spin it uh, amicably. But uh, it's pretty obvious that, like you said, a couple of, uh, for a couple months now at least, um, that there's been kind of a tension there between Candace Owens and uh, Ben Shapiro and, you know, and they're kind of going back and forth on that. So everybody's just kind of been waiting for the shoe to drop, you know, for for Ben Shapiro to just kind of, you know, get rid of her. Some people were speculating whether or not he had the power to do so. But uh, the point is now she's gone and uh, it's, it's an interesting circumstance, right? I mean, yeah. this uh, this concept of of um, of uh, maybe going against the, the mainstream consensus of uh, Israel and Palestine um, it's just kind of, it's, it's almost like a minefield, right? Because if you, if you go against the consensus, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, you're going to find yourself fired. You're going to be looking for employment. <laughs> yeah, I completely, Nick, you agree? Yeah, no, what's the thing that I found really interesting about really everything that's transpired since the war broke out has been, I would say to use more of a topical buzzword for our circles, like a schismatic tendency that you've seen in both political parties, <laughs> mostly in the yeah. left. But you do see this, I would say, more in the subculture on the right. So I think a lot of us have seen, whereas like, for instance, the kind of 19, like post-World War II, but especially like reaching its monolith, I would say in the 1980s through the early 2000s, like the neo libs and the neo conservatives forming forming a uniparty, we're all pretty consistent on this issue, and you still see a, a lot of those guys who have been in power since before all of us were born, right? They're still in power and they're still kind of giving the same arguments for um, mostly the state of Israel. But you've seen a lot of men uh, and women on the mostly the left, but also some on the right, really give alternate perspectives on this. And what I found to really be interesting is that, as I've kind of been observing, you do see this is more of a generational, I would say, divide mm -hmm. and gap. Um, a lot of young people seem to be way more inclined toward the Palestinian argument. A lot of older people seem to be way more inclined toward Israel. I am not inclined toward either. I'm still a Kingdom of Jerusalem boy, um, but uh, but I'm really just I'm really just pro American and very isolationistic. Um, so I'm kind of just like, why should we be involved? Regardless. That being said, I do think that this is interesting. Candace being relieved, if you will, from the Daily Wire because she was really, I would say, one of the heavy hitters of that whole organization. Um, and so I don't know if it really was something really between her and Shapiro. Part of me kind of thinks no, just because I'm like, 
you're both two adults like okay Mm -hmm. you guys already disagree on a plethora of issues like all the hosts do so to Mm -hmm. me like if this was an issue that they would divide over to where they get like someone would get fired that seems kind of extreme so i do think it most likely is something else perhaps it's her fighting with rabbis perhaps it's something else i don't know I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to definitely wait and see. I think that you're that's fair on that. I mean, the reality is that um, months ago, when even with the thing between her and Ben happened, Jeremy again put out a message from him and kind of represented Ben too, and was just like, you know, the reality is that we all have disagreements here. So, but we stand for free speech, and we've yeah. all talked about free speech and free speech in an integralist society. That was one of our first episodes, Rudy and I had you on for Nick. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, this is a good thing, but I just wanted to set the table a little bit with Candace. So Candace is in a very interesting situation. She popped up on the scene when probably what, five years ago, boys? That sounds about right. Five, six years ago, it five, seems six like. Years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was yeah. doing like turning point stuff with Charlie Kirk. She was cool. Like I liked her. Wasn't really like that, like involved with like watching her and stuff. I've started really watching her the past couple of months because or years because a couple things have happened. Number one, she married uh, George Farmer, who's a traditional Catholic from England and had like a very very traditional way of meeting and marrying this guy. I was like under a month and I'm like, hey, good, good for you. So that works. <laughs> like whatever, whatever's clever, right? Like that's mm-hmm. fine. But um, I think she's kind of, she's, she's kind of emerged a really interesting bridge. Obviously myself being black, uh, it's been kind of cool to see her become at first very antagonistic, this like he, she who shall not be named amongst different black uh, media and stuff. And then they invite her on, but actually boys literally, or not literally, but I've actually been seeing something interesting. I every once in a while I get these really, really small channels popping up on my YouTube recommendations. Um, it's like these like simple like black girl talking to camera kind of things. But mm. across a few of them has been this consistency of these these women, like Gen Z, our age women, talking about how much they like Candace Owens. They're like, I don't might not agree with what she says, but she looks so elegant and she's so well put together. And I'm like, that is a really, really interesting tool like that's not like she's put on an act but that's just nice to see right that amongst people who are not or have perhaps been politically suppressed uh not by any external force but by i think a lot of our own failing but that they're kind of recognizing that hey like the left isn't working out for me and Mm -hmm. this girl goes on there and she dresses well and she's married with children and she talks about how we got to get all these hoes out of culture and stuff and i i kind of like that a lot um but yeah to the main crux of it when this when this Israel Palestine thing happened uh, on October 7th. Um, I think Candace has been pretty neutral, but she has been, but this is like the third rail in conservatism. And I think us as traditional Catholics, we know this. Like part of becoming a traditional Catholic, Nick, you kind of said it, is that you do adopt this kingdom of Jerusalem mentality. And if you've grown up like me, that's very like grew up in like Republican conservative landia, right? One of the things you you believe is that Israel is the priority of America in a lot of ways. And that that means not just a support generally of the Jewish state of Israel, but that actually means like a lot of times like a carte blanche check. So mm. uh, obviously like I'm not getting into the fact that what happened on October 7th, obviously terrorism, right? Like Hamas firing and killing all the civilians. Nobody disagrees with this, but the idea that the counteraction of just leveling Gaza and killing and displacing potentially millions of peoples that's not a one-to-one. And I think that Candace pointed out those criticisms. She's gotten compared to Hitler a lot. Uh, this latest Rabbi Barkley thing was kind of interesting and they double and triple down. And I find boys that, again, there's this kind of third rail here in conservatism that you can't criticize. And the moment you do even fairly, then something like this does happen. You're told that they're gonna, people are gonna sue you. You're gonna lose your support. You're ignorant about an issue. But meanwhile, uh, it's you you were supposed to work hard give all your money to any foreign power anything like that it's interesting it's weird uh yeah for sure it's definitely a a third rail even even among uh catholics you know uh some people still kind of a shill for israel and um they have this um kind of a confused outlook as to what israel is uh, they think that uh, maybe they're still like um, uh, God's people, God's chosen people, and they don't realize that that the church is actually God's chosen people now, um, that the old covenant is no longer existing. They don't have a temple. They don't have a priesthood. Um, I, I think there's some chatter about them maybe reestablishing it. And that's one of the interesting things about this conflict is um, you've heard some people say that 
uh, that that's kind of the plan, right? That they're like, okay, well, I think it's time for us to to rebuild the temple. But what does that mean? Well, it means retaking Al Aqsa, which is the uh, the mosque. Uh, that's that's the uh, I believe that's uh, I'm not an expert in Israel, but I believe that's the uh, the foundation of the temple. And so uh, for them to to do that, that would be like a massive. I mean, that that would just like set things off even more. But um, I think it has to be said, uh, fellas, that you know um, there's there's a lot at stake here and. And I think maybe like people try and put you in a corner if you say that that you disagree with with like the expansion or the the way that Israel is reacting to the um, this terrorist attack, like you mentioned, Jordan. Um, right before I uh, let's just say I was uh, asked to leave uh, the radio station that I was working on uh, at, um, we had interviewed um, His Eminence uh, Pizza Bala. Who is the uh, he's the uh, the cardinal there in uh, in uh, the Holy Land, and uh, he was saying, you know, like the news isn't covering any of this, but there are many many starving Christians here in Gaza, mm -hmm. and they can't receive aid. They're being moved around back and forth. They don't know where to go, and and it's devastating. I mean, we even saw attacks on Catholic churches uh, by the IDF, and it's 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 crazy. Um, that we lose sight of how many Christians are actually live in Gaza. This isn't just like a, a, a an issue between uh, Muslims and Jews. This, yeah. is, this is something that affects uh, Christians, and we shouldn't forget about them. Yeah, absolutely right. Nick, set the table for us because – the, Rudy, you hit it right there out of the park. So this would be such a good segue. So the purpose of this video is not just to speculate on political intrigues, but it actually, of course, mm -hmm. is to talk about the Catholic understanding, because I think that's a huge thing that has opened my eyes a lot. So even as you said there, right, Nick, you you are our, our theological go to guy. So tell us a little bit about does indeed do we as Catholics, what do we believe now about uh, well, the Jews, essentially, do we treat Jews as other groups in which that they're all called to the fullness of truth? They all need to convert. Is there some sort of spec? Do they still hold the old covenant? You know, what what's the Catholic perspective there? Yeah, I'll do that. And then I'll also after that, I'll address maybe an interesting question for you guys, which is how is it that the United States and particularly the Republican Party has become very pro state of Israel? Um, because that is actually something that's rooted in um, a version of Protestantism that um, I think mm. most people who maybe are more in the political intrigue maybe don't understand that that's where it's rooted in. So the Catholic perspective is essentially this. I'll use a few terms to to kind of help. The Catholic doctrine traditionally on this subject has been called suppressionism, right? Suppressionism. Sometimes it's been called replacement theology. Replacement theology is a little bit easier, um, at least with the intellect, because it gives the idea of something being replaced. The Catholic understanding is that when our Lord died, he created the new covenant, right? The new covenant was founded in his blood. And as the book of Hebrews talks about, the death of the testator brings into a new testament so christ being the testator right he dies the new covenant is established in his blood and then the old covenant is done away with right it is gone and so it's actually sorry uh to interrupt oh, but it's so clear uh at the splitting of the of the temple veil mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. there was an obvious sign that it was over this is it exactly and, and and you see the entire practical way of the old covenant completely fall apart especially in the year 80, 70 with the sacking of Rome by by the Romans, because on a practical level, when you read through the Torah and you look at, especially in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the discussions on sacrifices for various things, whether that be sin offerings, guilt offerings, right? Um, all of these things require some type of sacrificial system, require the Levi priesthood, all of which does not exist anymore. And so the early Christian understanding, when you go back to the fathers, that the fathers were pretty unanimous on the subject that the church had replaced Israel, and that Israel in the Old Testament was a prefigurement of what the church was supposed to be like. So just as the Israelites in the Old Testament were a separated physical nation and had all of these laws when it came to their clothing and diet and things like that, all those laws were supposed to really – uh, really drill into the mind of the Israelites that you are a separate people chosen to be holy. 
And all of that was a sign for us that you are a separate people, right? Baptized in his blood, if you will. You are the separated children of God, and you're supposed to be different from the world. Another good reason why ecumenism is bunk is because if we are always trying to be pally with the world, when we're called to be separate from the world, right? It doesn't mean we're anti-people on this earth or anti-trees or something, but we're supposed to be away from the wickedness of this world. So the fathers were all unanimous on that. Going forward into the time, especially the medieval ages, you see the same consistency, both in the teachings of the popes as well as in the teachings of the scholastics, that the church had replaced Israel. And that um, really when it came to the Jews, right, you see, I would say, um, arguably unjust persecutions, mainly in the political realm. Oftentimes you would see um, bloodlettings arise in which um, Christians who were very, I would say, overzealous in their mm -hmm. in their um, hatred for the Jews would oftentimes um, do all types of mass murders and things along that nature, which is interesting because um, – and, and a lot of trads will fall into this. There is an interesting nuanced distinction on the question of like, did the Jews kill Christ? On the one hand, you see this explicit in Scripture. The answer is yes. But then you also see explicit in the teaching of the Council of Trent that all mankind is responsible because it required the death of Christ for all man's sin, mm. right? So we're all guilty of the death of Christ because of our own personal sin, right? Um, one priest, I think, very wisely said that every time uh, a soul commits mortal sin, right, and they were previously in a state of grace, it's like committing an abortion. You're murdering, if you will, sanctifying grace in the heart, right? So we're all mm. guilty of that. So the popes were clear on this. They tried to, on a political level, protect the Jews many times, um, but, you know, to greater or lesser successes. However, they were always very explicit. By the time of the 14th century, you really see explicit teaching on this in, in the context of the extraordinary magisterium um in particularly the council of florence you see not just the famous discussion on no salvation outside the church which is more well known right um but you see also um a discussion on is the old law still in t you know in act um when it comes to the ceremonial stuff like so seder meals passover the, the seventh day sabbath the dietary stuff is that still licit and both St. Thomas, right, in two centuries prior, as well as the Council of Florence, said, no, if a, if a Catholic was to go back and knowingly celebrate these things, right, this would actually be mortally sinful because mm. you are going back and practicing mm. a covenant which has been abrogated by the New Testament, which is quite telling because today you see a lot of Norman Catholics in the mainstream <laughs> oftentimes wishing Jews um, happy Hanukkah, happy Passover. I've we even did had one Seder student. meals growing up. I, uh, no way. I, I did it i did as well i did as well but i was protestant right that that was and you'll get you'll see a little bit more when we get to the second question but i did as well i had one student actually this week and in, in fact who told me that her family celebrates passover so i had to get this whole conversation rolling um because that's just like it, it it is a lot of like you know i would say pious novus ordo catholics who don't mm -hmm. know any better and they're just like oh this looks like an ancient religious thing may yeah, as well this is part in. of our tradition now too assume yeah yeah part of our overall patrimony i so mean we see... do have a jewish prayer right in the uh the eucharistic prayers so oh you oh, you yeah. do in the new mass <laughs> it's it's watch, watch my series it's like both the general instruction and the new mass missile as well as the catechism of the catholic church is very explicit that it is trying to get back to a jewish style meal in its aesthetics and, and in, in its structure so that's explicit mm -hmm. it's not a conspiracy theory yeah. um so you see this right it's the, it's the constant teaching of the church by the time though of post world war ii right you see of course the horrendous persecution of the jews during world war ii and you see as a result of that Pius the 12th right he does his best to shield the jews both one in his pre-world uh, pre World War II, excuse me, um, encyclical um, talking about really um, the problems with Nazism, right? So, this is the famous document that himself, as well as a little bit prior to that, Pius XI smuggled into Germany, right? It was the first encyclical in the vernacular, right? And it was smuggled <laughs> in overnight in motorcycles and read from every parish church. Uh, the next morning in Germany, which is pretty epic, like that type of undertaking, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's pretty cool. This is before the internet. And so they they read it out there, and it basically goes down this long litany of the problems with the Nazi regime. If viewers want to get into some of that, I have a video on my show called Catholicism versus Nazism where I 
go through the Nazi party platform and I show how it's absolutely 110% bunk because Hitler literally creates his own denomination, completely rewrites the Bible, tosses the Old Testament, rewrites the New Testament into Christ being this like- Which by the way, this might be one of my favorite videos you've ever done because for (laughs) me, it came out of completely left field or right field, take your field. (laughs) But I was just like, wow, dude, like he is going off. And I was never going to be a Nazi anyway, because I'm black and Catholic. So I kind of <laughs> kind of get disqualified. But I think that's great. I'll definitely we'll definitely link it below. That that's a great, great video. Watch watch Disney one day. They'll they'll make a World War II movie and they'll have like black Nazis. You know it's coming. <laughs> finally, you know it's coming. finally <laughs> representation. I can get that. We saw what happened to the AI, so that makes sense. Exactly, one hundred percent. So but yeah, so it's like Hitler goes insane, writes his own writes his own Bible. He makes Christ into literally this Nordic figure who came back to punish the children of Satan being the Jews. Like absolutely off the wall insane stuff. By the time though that the war is done, Pius the Twelfth, right, he continues though to reaffirm the Catholic doctrine on this issue, which is replacement theology, that the Jews had their covenant with the old God that was a prefigurement of the new covenant. But then when Christ died, all mankind is brought into the new covenant. And part of the reason that all mankind is welcomed is because, on the one hand, the Jews did reject Christ, right? But does that mean that they cannot be saved? No, right? St. Paul is very clearly explicit in that, that neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, right? Male or female, we're all one in Christ. All can come to the foot of the cross and be saved, right? The saints are very clear on this, et cetera. Now, they often right warn against Judaism as not just like a slightly lesser good religion. They'll often talk about how Judaism is because of what it really in its modern day, you know, preaches and, and teaches, um, really is um degrading of our Lord in many ways. So it's like you go through the Talmud, right, which is in I would say practical parlance, more of the Jewish holy book today than the Torah. And it says all kinds of blasphemous things about the person of Christ, you know, that he's mm-hmm. burning in hot excrement in hell, that he taught magic mm-hmm. and sorcery. And that was his miracles. He learned that when he went down to Egypt, that Our Lady was a prostitute, that Christ was, you know, the bastard son of a Roman soldier. So like all kinds of stuff. And so like on the one hand, you understand why, and I don't think that this is wrong, like that the fathers, the scholastics, that the popes had such harsh words for them. Yeah. On the other end, you can't go to the extreme of being like, hey, let's commit, let's, in reaction to this sin, go and commit sin. Yeah, put like them all to the sword, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Now, though, however, this is where the ambiguity gets, because, of course, the 1960s were a bastion of Catholic scholasticism, right? <laughs> yeah. Nope. No. <laughs> oh, it was great. Oh, it was great. Yeah, it, was, it was, it was wonderful. For some. <laughs> For some. <laughs> You start to see, especially in the well, you, we, it's I would say probably um, fortuitous that we're talking about this because you see this first start really in the Holy Week, quote unquote, reforms in, in the 1960 oh, oh, yeah. missile. Thanks, you Mimini. see, very cool. Yeah, you start to see the downplaying of the prayer for the conversion of the Jews, um, which was very, very controversial at that time, and still is in trad circles, obviously. Um, so much so controversial that I think we've had like seven versions of it now. Right. So we had like the original OG one, the Bunini one, the new mass one, Benedict's the 16th version of the old one. And then now this year, the bishops conferences in the United States have sent out to every parish priest, particularly stipulating that they're supposed to say, um, I think, like the watered down new mass version of it if they're celebrating wow. the new mass. Um, so it's like <laughs> oh, it's wow. it, it, because of the, po- the politics going on right now. Unreal. So in the 60s, you start to see that happen. Um, And then after the council, right, so you see the council was very much so influenced by um, Catholics who rightly so were horrified at what had happened in World War II because it was in many times Catholics killing Catholics, you know, it was horrible stuff. Um, And then rightly so horrified at what had happened when it came to the slaughter of the Jews, but decided to go into the opposite direction, which was truly an uncharitable move, by deciding to downgrade the church's theology, so much so that I could get into the weeds on this, but most explicitly in the papacy of uh, Paul VI and then John Paul II, you see not an explicit reversal, but in their encyclicals, a complete change of tone, and I would say a borderline reversal in the context of their discussions on the Jews. So they refer to the Jews now as the older brother and that the Jews have a active covenant with God. Mm-hmm. That was the big thing that they have this active covenant with God, and it's in the old covenant. 
So much so that when you go and you read the new mass missiles prayer for the Jews for Good Friday, in my opinion, this is the probably closest area of the new mass in tandem, which gets close to the H word, right, to heresy, the closest area, because it explicitly prays that their covenant with God can continue. Mm -hmm. And how they get out of the full heresy world is that at the end, it says that they may one day find the fullness of truth in Christ. So it's like this little tidbit that they add at the end just to escape. Yeah, I just made it, yeah. It's like, like, a, it was, like a partial covenant or something, yeah. something that's it's never part, really existed. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyway, Nick, was this in like an encyclical? How did they decide this? I mean, obviously they they it made yeah. it into the mass, but where where can people find that? So I would say first check out Nostra Aetate, so on other religions that you see in the council. So they, mm -hmm. they basically, Nostra Aetate, it just talks about all the good things of, quote, other religions. Mm -hmm. um, we know about that, it, don't we, Rudy? Nostra yeah. Aetate. <laughs> Everything good. And then Paul the Sixth, but really I would say John Paul the Second is the one who, in if you just look up um, you know, John Paul II encyclicals when it comes to the Jews, you'll be able to find various paragraphs in many of his documents or various statements in his speeches where he'll very much so clearly teach that you are the older brother in Christ, mm -hmm. that you have an active covenant with God. So much so that um, John Paul II actually, with the Vatican's funds, paid for the first construction of a synagogue, the first synagogue ever in the city of Rome. You know, and this is, this is you know, apparently, you know, based 1980s ecumenism, if you will. It's really been wow. horrific what was going on. Um, so that stuff continued. Benedict the Sixteenth was, I would say, a little bit more tempered than John Paul II. He was definitely not a trad by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it's really hard because Benedict, the thing is, is that he, since he was a theologian, he just wrote so much. That was his mm -hmm. life. And so there's many passages where you'll read that are very much so the status quo of the John Paul II papacy. But then you read other areas which rabbis got very angry at him with, which was he would talk about the need for the Jews to convert. Now, he was in charge of the Holy Office, but there was another guy who was also in charge of the Department on Ecumenism, right? A department that clearly did not exist underneath the, the former papacies of Pius XII or anything going back. And this was Cardinal Casper, right? Walter Casper, who was in mm -hmm. charge of the um, Christ, both the Congregation for Christian Unity and Ecumenism. You can find this stuff easy online too. They explicitly have edicts and directives for all Catholic mission groups to not try to proselytize and convert Jews. Hmm. Explicitly to not try to do those things. And the, the reason given is that they already have a covenant with God. Which my response to that is there's a great book that the Cardinal should read. It's called Galatians. Right or Hebrews, <laughs> right? So there's great books on this. Um, it's like the old covenant is gone. That's the that's the whole point of the New Testament is that the old covenant, which wasn't bad, right? But yeah. it wasn't what we needed. Yeah, it was fulfilled, fulfilled. in the person so, of Christ. I want to understand even what that means as far as the church is. So would that say just for a Catholic in the pew, therefore, that if it's almost like when when Bishop Bear and and Ben Shapiro are on together, right? And Shapiro mm -hmm. asks his excellency, can I be saved, right, as a mm -hmm. Jew? And I was growing up my entire life thinking that, well, uh, the book of Acts, I right? believe into the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So just a question mm -hmm. of do you do everything according to the old law? The answer is no. Then even by your own law, you're not being saved. But God has fulfilled this through the incarnation. But would Casper then say, actually, because there is this, this dual kind of covenant, there's a dual covenant going on. So actually... If a Catholic is to die and to go to heaven, he would actually see Jews who have followed the old law still post-Christ? Is that what the implication would be? That's the inevitable conclusion. That's the only conclusion logic would dictate. And that's why Bishop Barron's you know, statement is really, really egregious because— you know, even like even if venture, like his answer is basically follow your conscience, mm. like, follow your conscience, which is a complete butchering of traditional the privilege way. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it's it's hor it's horrific because aside from the fact that you literally, as we just ex explained, have explicit dogma in the church that the Old Testament is done, and that if you were to go back and knowingly practice this, that this would be mortally sinful. Aside from that, it completely erases the necessity of Christ. If you just make him the privileged route, 
it doesn't work. There's actually, if people are really, really interested on the subject of the privilege route, there's a book called No Salvation Outside the Church that was written by Monsignor, I think it was um, Fenton, who was a Catholic manualist in the 1960s. Very, very good that you should check out. It's like two or 300 pages. It discusses this, and he actually explicitly talks about the notion that was starting to come around in the 1960s on the Catholic Church is the privileged route for salvation. If you go back before then, in all the manualist tradition, the scholastics going back, you don't see that language of the privileged route. They basically say, yes, in theory, if a person was to keep the natural law completely perfect and never commit a mortal sin, in this abstract theory, of course a person could be saved, right? If they desired God, they believed in God, they you know had faith, if you will, um, and they're still going to be saved through the church in spite of their mm -hmm. false religion. In the abstract sense, that is true. But in the concrete, how many people do you guys know who have never committed a mortal sin who are kept like the natural law perfectly? That just doesn't exist. And when you have explicit dogma that one, baptism is necessary for salvation, two, that even if you were to die with original sin only, that the soul is deprived of the beatific vision, what conclusion is Bishop Barron going to make? He's not making a Catholic conclusion. So it, it really is egregious. I guess maybe to finish up this, because I don't want to hog all your guys' time, at least when it comes Nonsense to the, the, the speaking spark. Um, but so that's kind of been like the Catholic, if you will, ethos is that you have trads now, right, who, if they get into this subject, right, I would say can get a good balanced understanding, which is you go back, you read the tradition, and you realize, okay, well, the New Testament – fathers the popes the scholastics the manuals are all pretty clear on this subject that the church has has superseded israel and then if you follow the new faith it completely falls off the edge of the cliff because you are having to reinterpret all of those things um in a bizarro sense benedict got in trouble also because when Samorum pontificum was released um there was a group of not just italian bishops that were very liberal that were outraged at this um, also, of course, famously, Cardinal Roach absolutely hated so Norm Pontificum. If people want to see, this is the thing. If you want to figure out the Francis Pontificate, go back and do research on all the guys he appoints, and you mm -hmm. just do do your political deep dive, and you'll find that Cardinal Roach, right, who we put in charge of liturgy, when some Norm Pontificum came out, he said, "Okay, well, I hate this, but I'll allow this," and he regulated the traditional mass to like this basement college yeah. chapel in like at like five o'clock in the evening. You know, and so like he was very explicit. So it's like, why would you make him the guy in charge? Like if you're wanting to get the trads to quote be more in lockstep, like why didn't you put keep keep Sarah there, right? Why mm -hmm. didn't you put Burke in that position? Like that would have made way more sense if you were to try to be buddy buddy, but you're not. So Benedict, he gets in he gets in trouble with the the Italians, but he also gets in trouble with the rabbis. And the reason is they say that your prayer for the Jews is anti-Semitic. And so Benedict, of course, he kind of t tones down the language, right? And I think today it depends on what parish you go to. I've seen some that will do Benedict's version. I see some that do the old version. Um, how does this play, though, when it comes to Americans? I think in the American context, the reason that we look and see that the, the, the neocon right, if you will, not the old school right, but the neocon right is so pro-Israel is because you see particularly in the 1830s, the rise of dispensationalism. Are you guys very familiar with dispensationalism? No. I, I know a little. So give a quick drive-by, please. Yeah, a quick drive-by is essentially in all Protestant denominations, essentially held on to what I just outlined with the Catholic belief, even though they didn't hold to the Catholic Church. They basically believe that the, the Christian Church, this universal mystical thing, is still replacing Israel. Until the 1830s, when you had one of the famous Plymouth Brethren, this is not the Puritans, right? This is not the Pilgrims, but a later denomination. The Plymouth Brethren, a guy by the name of um, John Nelson Darby, who had uh, a lady who had some mystical, quote-unquote, revelations, where she saw the rapture take place, but it was before the tribulation, and that the Jews were still God's chosen people. He went on to create his own uh, translation of the scripture and founded a basically a theological stream known as dispensationalism, which is that God has divided up all of time according to different periods that they mm -hmm. call dispensations. Sometimes a person Would this is saved be millennial, premillennial? Is that what that means? So it's a version of premillennialism. So there okay. is a, a historic premillennialism that you do see in some of the fathers, but this would be what's called dispensational premillennialism. And so they divide up the, the, the all of time by essentially seven periods, and they hold to this belief 
that the Jews are still the chosen people of God. Really where this gets popularized is that later on in the 1880s, there was a gentleman by the name of C.I. Schofield who created a study Bible, and this was really revolutionary in that time. Schofield and they sent Bible. this study Bible that was very pro-Zionistic to all of the Baptist and evangelical seminaries. This really took off, and this is why today you see a lot of Baptists and evangelicals are very pro-Israel. So it took off. It became very, very famous when World War II was done and the creation of the state of Israel was, was made. This was a way of the United States government getting particularly Southern Baptists and Southern evangelicals very much so on board with the idea of the state of Israel was they pointed to passages like Genesis chapter 12 of Abraham when – God is, you know, commissioning Abraham, right, to go to the promised land. He says, you know, whosoever blesses thee, I will bless. Whoever curses thee, I will curse. And they will just say, well, what that means is that whoever blesses Israel is blessed. Whoever curses Israel or goes against Israel is cursed. Not to, mm -hmm. aside from the whole problem that when you keep reading and then you read the book of Galatians, you see that what that's talking about is through your seed will the blessing come, and the seed mm. is Christ. So anyone mm -hmm. who blesses Christ will be blessed. Anyone who curses Christ will be cursed. That's the wow, whole it's point. Like it's, it's not just about Christianity a... there, huh? Exactly. It's not talking about a country created in 1948. That's not what <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's Such really, really anti-Semite, bro. Goodness. <laughs> it's really weak. But that's basically, I mean, that's the short version of it. Like the reason that you do see the right, broadly speaking, today still support it is really because of that tradition. That tradition was also the same tradition that created the um, left behind rapture narrative, right? You mm. do see you you see you do see theologians mm -hmm. debate versions of the rapture before Protestantism even came out, but there was never this idea of at any moment, right? We're all just doing our thing, and then Christians all of a sudden, boom, are gone, and then there's this seven year tribulation that takes place, et cetera, et cetera. And so, last thing I'll say is that in Catholic theology. What we do believe is that we do believe in a real antichrist figure. We do believe in a real falling away from the faith. Um, but we do also believe that one day, as St. Paul says, all of Israel will be saved. So one of the, the classic signs, according to all the theologians, that the end of the world is here and that Christ will return is that all of the Jews will one day recognize Christ as Messiah. So, yeah, and well, so be it. I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'm glad that you say that because Rudy, we've talked about this before, right? But you've heard this in conservative circles, and I have, I have a really good Calvinist friend who, who laid out exactly what you laid out. One day, I was like, "Why do Republicans?" And you know, I'm pretty conservative trad, but like, why do Republicans have this really weird support for Israel? It's just even just as a as a guy who just doesn't want a lot of foreign involvement, it's weird. And he said, "Well, it's simple because again, you guys have replacement theology; we have covenant theology." Is, yeah. is how I explained and I was and I was like oh well okay that makes sense so Rudy you've heard this though right where you'll hear someone politically say okay well even what Nick just said there one day the Jews will be saved that there is this plan and revelation for the Jews to be saved still means as an impetus for Christians to support the the proliferation and the the uh, the protection of Israel then you've ever heard that before like if we don't um, we're not somehow doing our salvific work on earth no, I've never heard that like explicitly like that. But yeah, I mean, I've heard people say like, oh, well, you know, it's better that we support Israel because of those holy sites that are there. At least, you know, we'll have access to them and they'll be maintained in some sort of way or form, you know, and so they'll make that argument. But uh, I don't know, maybe maybe I haven't been paying attention enough to uh, to hear that that argument before. Got it. Well, this is, and this is why I think, gentlemen, if you haven't already, take a piece through uh, the Rabbi Barclay debate that Candace did. It's like two mm -hmm. hours long, if I remember correctly, right? So definitely just like behind, I mean, and I, I always listen in bursts because I always like, scream something, right? But one thing that comes <laughs> out of that is essentially this overwhelming understanding that, and again, if you're a, if you're a Jew, I, I think I, I get it, right? If you really do believe that you're God's chosen people, if you really believe that you've been that the Amalekites are still out there, then that might be one thing. But the idea was it wasn't enough just to condemn October 7th and say, yeah, that was a terrorist attack. And by the way, if you bomb a hospital or a bunch of residential areas in Gaza, that's an atrocity too. It was this hierarchy. It's very, it was very weird. It was this hierarchy of the importance of persons almost. And mm, yeah, at the end, and it's kind of, and we talk about Zionism, right? And this is kind of it. And again, like, I, I don't, none of us here, I mean, anti-Semitism, it's like racism, right? You can, call, or homophobia, it's like, you just blink and it's just, aha, you hate Jews. Of course, I know, none of us hate Jews. We want 
everybody to come to the fullness of the truth, right? I, I have no anger. None of us have any anger for people who are Jewish. We want people to come to Christ. That's the entire point because mm. Jesus is real. He existed and he exists and he will exist. And that's what we're called to do as Christians. It doesn't mean that we have to lock Jews away in ghettos per se or something, right? I'm not talking about a political idea, but just in terms of brotherhood, our love for fellow man is the desire for conversion. Um, but with Rabbi Barkley or a lot of these kind of more Zionist positions, what you get an understanding of is that we exist really at the subservience of a Zionist mission. And um, they also exist in Islam and other things too. But obviously with Zionism, what you get this understanding is that there is this Jewish supremacy. And Nick, I love what you talked about with the, um, the Christians in the Middle East earlier. I mean, the reality is that they have been completely squeezed out of Palestine and have already been discriminated against in Jerusalem. And, um, and so one thing I did this year, guys, is I actually donated to uh, the Mission of Hope and Mercy, which uh, is out of like Our Lady of Hope Church down there in Palestine. And there were some Christians, there were Catholics, it's a Catholic church, Catholics after mass one day, and I was just kind of talking chop with them. How's the situation over there? And they're all like, it's not good. And there are orders of nuns, for instance, who will be like kind of in the way of this war going on in Palestine. And they can't go into Israel because they're Palestinian, but they're mm -hmm. Christians. And so it gets messy. And one thing that I, I think that Candace hit the hornet's nest on in particular is that the virtue of being an American, the virtue of being a conservative, and the virtue of being a Christian does not somehow de facto entitle you to run around and make me hate other people without having some sort of self-interest of that. And so now I've seen, there are even senators now, one very recently was talking about how essentially there's no such thing as an innocent Palestinian. Um, again, I'm not really a huge fan of Muslims, as you can probably imagine, right? Got a got a couple of icks and isms about the Crusades, but again, I'm like, <laughs> let's not kill kids. Like maybe that's a good Catholic position, right? Like let's not kill kids. I don't know if you've, you've like encountered that sort of Zionistic zeal, of everything's anti-Semite, unless you, support the somehow secular Jewish state of Israel. And if you don't, even Catholics now will say that we're bad Catholics for, for doing something yeah. like that. I've seen, I've seen both extremes literally in the same parish. So before my parish got nuked off the face of the planet, <laughs> um, I, uh, oh. I saw both, I, I saw both extremes. I, I, I had this one gentleman, God rest his soul. It's crazy. He was in his, I think like late fifties, met him for the first time, had this discussion it died two weeks later. It was crazy. Mm. It just passed away. It was very sad. But um, yeah, he, he, I was at this uh, like breakfast table essentially, and all these old guys, you know, after mass, they're talking about politics because what else do old guys talk about? Uh, <laughs> what else do guys talk about, really? And he, uh, he like, like someone brought up basically what you had just brought up, Jordan, this reality of like the ends don't justify the means. And I think that what can be good in this discussion is that whole Catholic understanding of just war theory, right? The, the problem is that, you know, really recently you've seen with the the modern popes, they've really just kind of um, taken correctly that, you know, war is a sin against the virtue of charity, but then they've blown this up to the a pacifist perspective to where it's just like you can't defend yourself or can't do mm -hmm. like any violence, if you will, whenever it's necessary. So I think people have to remember what is you know just war theory so this gentleman he he overhears people talking about like the ends don't justify the means and he gets just really really passionate about like you know um like they're defending themselves against terrorism which is completely licit of course um but then kind of just goes off into this realm of like if you have any questions against this then you're an anti-semite and what i found interesting about this whole discussion was the fact that it's like again you know i'm we're all young here and a lot of us don't have maybe that same maybe emotional tie to the politics of yesteryear that maybe our parents or our grandparents did. Um, so we can kind of look at this fresh. And so the way I looked at it was, yes, like this was evil, what took place to them. Like these guys coming over, murdering people, mm -hmm. beheading children, horrible, evil, absolutely should be condemned. And if I was to play advocate, I can understand if you have a terrorist organization who is spent literally years digging tunnels underneath their own country, using their own people as civilians and uh, or using their own civilian population as human shields and yeah. is you you know literally sawing out drainage ditches to use as rockets. like okay, evil, evil organization. But on the flip side, it does not therefore mean that the IDF is, you know, the first crusade 
full of holy <laughs> zealous men trying to do the right thing, right? My point was really that this binary situation that we're being forced into, you're either one or the other. You're either for Israel or against mm -hmm. Israel. I don't see why we, as Catholics, number one, should be forced into that. Um, we should really, at the end of the day, just with Catholic principles, say, okay, yeah, this was evil on both sides of the situation, and we can talk about who started it, of course, sure. Um, but what are we going to do now? We have to go in there and be the hands of feet in Christ. We have to you know, take care of those who are sick, the wounded. We have to go in there and tend to those who are suffering. Right, we have, of course, got to pray for peace in the Middle East. Those are the those are the Christian actions that we need to do. And then, of course, we can hash out the politics in the end. But I just hate that we're being forced into this. And I think it again, it is because of the political class with power and money. Power and money is very much so a big thing when it comes to the state of Israel, and then on the left when it comes to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And I think we as Americans should just be focused mostly our aims on Americans, like defending our own border, which is completely being Never overrun run. at the moment. You guys right? know, Actually, you're Texans. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. And, and Rudy, <laughs> Rudy knows now, Rudy knows now because it's like, he, he's living, he lives in one of the biggest cities inside of Texas. And, yeah. you know, I live, I think it's like two and a half to three hours away from the border. And I see all the time driving a by 35, all these buses, right, filled with the illegals. And of course, our governor, right, he's thankfully busing a lot of them out, but then he'll, he's, he's doing what he can. Yeah, here in Colorado, which, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's doing Sanctuary what he can. Sanctuary city over there. <laughs> but it's like, you look at, for, as an example, New York City, and it's completely overrun. So my friend mm -hmm. Anthony, right, Anthony and Rob, shout out to them on Avoiding Babylon, right? He, he talks about how, like, all the hotels, all the schools are being completely yep. overrun, but yet all the homeless people are still left out on the streets. We could have put all these homeless people inside of all of this stuff eons ago mm -hmm. but we're not doing it so my point is not that we should be like oh you know hate this group love this group etc my point is as christians we need to say okay subsidiarity first off let's just focus on being here and say there's homeless people in our own neighborhoods right we have an invasion mm -hmm. of a lot of chinese age military males coming across the southern border Co coincidence i don't think so um and then after that let's go into these other situations let's not Go in there and pick sides, especially when we don't have to. Yeah. But let's go and be the hands and feet of Christ and say, okay, there are wounded people on both sides. It's kind of like that scene in uh, The Patriot, right, where you see Mel Gibson, right? He has both the British Redcoats and the Patriot soldiers wounded on his front porch taking care of them, right? That yeah. is kind of a good image of what a Christian should be, if you will. Yeah, that before, you know, after he hatchets them, just really want to. I just want to know exactly before, before, before he hatches them. Yeah. He hatches. What, what were you saying, Rudy? You know, when this first started, um, I started to figure it out, you know, because it was reminding me of Ukraine, and I, I kind of have the same opinion about Ukraine that I have about uh, the Israel and Palestine conflict. And you know, I'd get in arguments with people, uh, when the, the Ukraine invasion happened or the Ukraine war happened and, and they would say things like, Oh, Putin's evil, Putin's evil. And I, I would just try to like understand why Putin would want to do something like this. Sure enough, when Tucker Carlson interviewed him, I got kind of the, the, the confirmed an idea about why he would do this. So he has this kind of concept that Ukraine has always been part of, of Russia, et cetera. And, um, and so he, like it or not, is trying to recapture something that he feels belongs to Russia. Now, in the same in the same way, I was trying to figure out, well, how is it that we had this this Palestinian conflict? And I saw this uh, interesting documentary. I don't really recommend it because they glorify this person a lot, but it was this documentary on uh, Leila Khaled. Leila Khaled is this uh, this like uh, celebrity figure. A Palestinian freedom fighter woman. I think she's coined to be like one of the first uh, Palestinian terrorists or one of the first women to have captured an airplane or something like that. Dang. And it's an interesting documentary. And she talks about this displacement that she had felt all of her life, um, you know, losing her home and wanting to recapture it. And, and, and so that's kind of their motivation, right? There's a lot of people there who have the same motivations. They want to, to return to their homeland. They have this concept of homeland. And, and that formed my opinion on this, you know, it's, it's it, like you said, Nick, you know, it, 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 we're very, we're almost painted to the corner, we have to take a side, right? So they say, well, it's either Israel or, or Palestine, you know, where are you, where are you at on that? And the fact of the matter is, it's so much more nuanced, that we have to take a step back and just look at it, just 
by by what's happened, you know, by by the history, by the history aspect. And and I think as modern Americans, we have this tendency to want to jump onto something and just kind of like um, like have some sort of tribal uh, outlook to everything, every every political mm -hmm. story. We have to have this this tribal uh, identity to you know either this person or the other person or this organization, this other or other organization, and like. I think that as as Catholics, uh, we have to look at this, uh, as you mentioned, from a theological perspective, you know, like, this is, uh, this is a matter of, of identifying that the, the, the Jewish people, uh, gosh, I'm like going off on a tangent here. Uh, but essentially, what I'm trying to say is uh, <laughs> that the, um, the covenant has been fulfilled in our Lord. Right. So when we talk about the Jews, and now I can focus in here. When we talk about the Jews, um, and we may be painted off as this uh, this villain because we take this side, we have to look at it from the perspective that these people have been waiting for the Messiah for a long time, and unfortunately, so many of them have missed uh, the the reality that the Messiah has come. And so it's not charitable for us to to continue to say like, oh, these people are completely fine where they are. A charity means telling them that that the Messiah has come and that he has restored uh, or rather has uh, established a new covenant and invite these people to to join the church. Right. And the problem with this is we find ourselves uh, being labeled as anti-Semites the same way that if you you know, if you say something completely uh, different from the consensus, you're labeled a racist or a bigot or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we have to kind of work through that and, and like we're doing right now, have a, a serious conversation about the things that we believe and why we believe them and, and the circumstances, the context uh, of, of uh, all the things that we're seeing unfold. And so I think context matters a lot. Yeah, and in, in having that like nuance of saying that we're not going to be like pinned into a tribalistic mentality, I think is important because when you, I think, take a step back and realize that so many of the people who push tribalism, right, particularly at the top, it's mostly motivated by the two facets of power and money. When you look at it through that lens, you see that it's like, okay, um, you know, the race hustlers, whether they be, you know, Al Sharpton or David Duke, right? The only reason that they are race hustlers is because of power and money, right? When you look at the guys in charge of Congress, right? Many of them are in their positions of power and say the most bombastic things, not because they really genuinely hate the other person's guts, but because they know that their constituents, it's way easier to be in a tribalistic mentality than a nuanced mentality. And it's way easier to stay in power, particularly, and this is, I think, one thing I do remember Candace Owen, she actually brought up recently. I think it might have been on Charlemagne's show where she said that if you think about it, if we had term limits, right? these guys would be trying to shrink the size of government because they'd be having to join the private sector again fairly <laughs> soon than later. Whereas mm. the fact that these guys have been in power forever, it's power and money increase the size of government. Mm. And they want people to be in like, you know, if you will, um, stuck on their welfare payroll of just being in, indebted to them and being reliant upon them. So I think as Catholics, how we have to respond to this is first off, just recognizing that, um, if, if people disagree in these areas, which are clearly not like aside from the, the theological aspects, but like when it comes to these political stuff, that we should form our, our conscience with our faith and we should have charity for people who are who are searching these things out. Um, so I think that's one. But then two, asking ourselves like practically what we can do. Right. So we, we should, of course, pray. That's the most important thing. Um, but then also at the same time, um, inform ourselves. But I would say um, take caring of your local community is infinitely more important many times mm -hmm. than scrolling on social media, stressing out about a war um, across the sea that, you know, really I think that we shouldn't have anything to do with. And so I think that's just what when, one thing that's so important is just that subsidiarity that we've lost as Americans through the, you know, if you will, virtual uh, international village. Nick, Rudy, oh my gosh, guys, it has been 
a stupid conversation. It's been a, a ton of fun uh, for our audience. Please don't forget, of course, to keep Candace Owens in your prayers. Keep uh, the Jewish people in your prayers. Like I said, there's no there's no hatred here. There's and the Palestinians and all Muslims and all people for that matter, because the desire is, of course, to come to the fullness of the truth. If any of you are interested in supporting a Christian mission out there in the Middle East, we had people again from the Mission of Hope and Mercy. It's an apostolate of uh, Our Lady of Hope. It's uh, St. Rafka Church out there. This is a pretty great, they're very low key. They're very, very clear with how their money goes, but they have a mission of helping Christians in that part of the world. And so it was really a pleasure for me to be able to talk to them. So again, I'll just link that down below if you can prayerfully consider maybe making a, a last charitable contribution this Lent to really help out our brothers and sisters who are really caught between these two behemoths out there. I hate that I'm about to say this next part because technically, Rudy, uh, the traditional Thomist has 50 more subscribers than Gladtrad on YouTube. <laughs> but nonetheless, people, check out Nick's channel. Don't forget, of course, to like and subscribe all of his videos, especially subscribe. He's going through a great series right now on the new mass. And Rudy, I actually want to, I, I don't know if you want me to plug your baby project, but I saw it the other day <laughs> and I want people to know this. There is a secret channel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called Magnificat Scriptorium, and it is some certain Rudy Carlos, maybe or maybe not. But Rudy, what you do there <laughs> is you're just in a very therapeutic, really nice way. You're just making these videos restoring uh, ancient books, right? Book binding and all that stuff. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm actually uh, in the process of editing another video, a part two of uh, a series of videos that I'm doing, um, restoring some prayer books that I have uh, acquired over the, the past couple of years. Um, I'm working on one from the uh, like mid 1800s. And um, really interesting, uh, you know, I was uh, working on this project. And I, I just thought, this is so, it's so unique that the person who owned this book was a Catholic. And mm. now their book is in my hands and I can actually know their name and pray for them, you know, pray for their repose. So that was an interesting thing that I discovered on the project. Uh, but I'm going through and rebinding books um, and uh, really kind of making an effort to uh, to make a channel devoted to this. So if you would like to subscribe, uh, check out the YouTube channel Magnificat Scriptorium. Uh, Magnificat, uh, of course, uh, is a reference to Our Lady. Um, a previous project that I worked on was uh, one that was called Magnificat Handmade, which was a kind of like a pun on, uh, you know, <laughs> Our Lady being a handmade, but a lot of things that were handmade uh, were things that I was focusing on. But uh, the channel is up, so if you'd like to subscribe, I'd appreciate it. I'm trying to reach 100 uh, subs, and once I get to 100, I'm going to be giving away one of the uh, one of the books that I restore. So uh, Ooh, keep, keep in touch for that. Definitely. I'll link, as always, both of your guys' stuff down below. Listeners and viewers, all thank you so much. We'd love to hear your stories, your comments. Don't forget to like this video, to subscribe to the Glad Chad podcast, and of course, to share this video far and wide. Thank you, each and every one of our YouTube members, as well as our patrons. Don't forget to head on over to patreon.com slash Glad Chad podcast if you would like to support the show. A lot of fun perks, as well as becoming a channel member. Again, a lot of really fun perks for you guys. Well, until next time, for all of us here, I'm Jordan Pacheco. That's Rudy Carlos. That's Nick Vasos. We'll see you later. Adios.